If you're holding out hope for a bull market, then please pay close attention. According to legendary investor Mark Chaikin, who Jim Cramer famously said he never bet against, a new wave of volatility is coming for the stock market and investors need to act immediately. Mark's prediction is based on an indicator that has only triggered a handful of times in the last 72 years, with a 100% success rate for predicting where stocks will go next. During Mark's 50-year career, he's worked alongside some of the biggest investors in history, including Paul Tudor Jones and Michael Steinhardt. In fact, Mark invented one of Wall Street's most popular indicators for picking stocks, still used by hedge funds, banks, and brokerage sites, and today found in every Bloomberg terminal on the planet. Now, Mark's inviting you to watch his brand new event as he explains exactly what the next wave of volatility will look like and where it will send stocks in the coming weeks. He's even sharing one of his favorite ideas free for those who tune in. He says this idea could create bigger gains than anything he's used his power gauge system for until now by turning the coming market volatility to your advantage. And you don't have to wait until March 28th to get started. For a sneak peek of Mark's big reveal, go to shakenevent.com. Again, that's shakenevent.com. Hi, welcome back to the Daniela Camboni Show here on the road in Zurich, Switzerland with my next guest, no stranger to our program, Willem Middlecope, author of The Big Reset, a book written in 2013, but how timely, and we're going to talk about all this, but first, welcome, yeah. Willem, welcome. Yeah, well, welcome uh, in, in Geneva, or oh, in Geneva, I was born in Geneva, welcome, welcome in Switzerland, to yes, yes. welcome to Zurich. I always feel at home here. Absolutely. So, uh, and yeah. uh, there's no shortage of news. I was so excited to, to speak with you. I mean, of course, the bank run. But we, we uh, got a present of, uh, by President Xi uh, of China. <laughs> he, he, he delivered a great uh, well, a present to us uh, Ex yesterday in Moscow. Exactly. So let's talk about that. Basically, Moscow coming out saying, you know what? Yuan is now our preferred uh, currency of uh, trade amongst BRIC nations. I mean, could we really see the emergence, Willem, of the Petro One in this multipolar world. Yeah. Is it happening? We've Your take. Been, we've been writing about it. Uh, I've been writing about this for almost 20 years that one day we would see the end of the petrol dollar system. What's the petrol dollar system? It's an agreement between the OPEC countries and the US that all oil would always be sold only in dollars, US dollars. Well, now we have an end to that petrol dollar system because we have seen. Uh, the Saudis telling everybody that they are accepting other payments as well. So they have done trades with China already in Yuan. So actually, it is the end of the petrol dollar system. And the big question is, is this the start of the petrol Yuan system? And with the statements made uh, coming from Moscow in the last 24 hours, last 48 hours, it's quite obvious that uh, uh, President Xi has his master plan and he, he's rolling out his master plan. And Part of that master plan is that uh, he can trade oil in yuan, and that's highly beneficial for China. Uh, and, and the U.S. won't like it. <laughs> yes, I, well, I, you know, I, I looked at this figure. Uh, you know, obviously China wanting to position the, the the currency here as the the reserve currency of the world. Yeah. Yeah. 32 percent of its four trillion foreign exchange reserves invested in U.S. government debt. 32 percent of its uh, of its four trillion invested in U.S. government debt. So obviously they're looking to increase the clout of uh, the yuan here. The question, Willem, is what is the U.S. to do? I mean, they're looking at this thinking what? Well, actually, um, in one of the previous interviews, I think I pointed out to a book, The Grand Chessboard by Brzezinski. Brzezinski was the security chief by President Carter. And he wrote in the Grand Chessboard, everybody can download it for free, you can find it on YouTube, it's not a very uh, large book, so you can read it over the weekend. And he said the worst scenario, the most dangerous scenario for the US is when Russia teams up with China and possibly Iran. Right. And now we have the Saudis exactly. making peace with Iran, so we could have an even more dangerous situation that China is in bed with Russia, Iran, and the Saudis are pivoting from west to east. And that's, that's, that's a dangerous scenario. That's the most dangerous scenario, according to Brzezinski. He wrote that, I think, in the 90s. And, and it's all coming to fruition now. Yeah, well, I'm happy you brought that up because, like you said, the, the Saudis getting cozier with Iran in a deal brokered uh, by China. Yeah. Uh, 
yet the U.S. has really, you know, positioned China now as, well, and Russia, two enemies, numero uno. Yeah. Um, and, and, and is it backfiring on them already here? Well, um, China and, and the Saudis know they play a dangerous game because we've had Saddam Hussein in the past. We've had Gaddafi, who, who stopped selling their oil for dollars. Well, we know what happened to them. But of course, the Saudis and China, they know they're very powerful, especially when they join forces. So what, what can the U.S. do? Start a world war with all of them? I, I really hope not, Willem. I hope no, that's not that's the direction that we're headed in. But but it's getting scary because the Chinese, what, what surprises me, and that, that, that's why I think there's some kind of uh, master plan right. being rolled out. Because we had this China broker deal between uh, Iran and Saudi. That was, uh, well, one, one or two months ago. Now we have this uh, meeting in Moscow. Everybody was expecting maybe a peace deal uh, for Ukraine, but they had, they had this idea. So it, it's, it's quite clear that um, China is, um, and we should say that President Xi has a plan. And uh, it's also very uh, visible if you study the way the Chinese communicate. The Chinese never gave any negative opinions about the U.S. in the 90s and the 2000s. But now they're coming out with some very negative statements, pointing to all the failures of U.S. foreign policy, pointing to the regime change, even pointing to the fact that the U.S. have killed some foreign leaders. So they are much more aggressive from, from that point of view. Uh, and, and the big question for me is, what's next? <laughs> I think presidency is not done yet. It's part of a plan. Any insights as to what that plan looks like? Well, we have some uh, indications. Um, you, I think you're aware of the publications by Zoltan Posa of yes. Credit Suisse. I hope he finds a new job with UBS uh, <laughs> somewhere else. Yes. But we also had a research paper by ING Bank, Dutch ING Bank, and they pointed to, um, well, um, some statements by Putin. Um, this was in June last year, and Putin was uh, remarking that the BRICS were planning to introduce a new common currency with the BRICS countries. And we haven't seen anything about that. We, we, we know, that was told to us yesterday, that Russia is in favor that trade between the BRICS nations mm -hmm. will be done in Yuan, mm -hmm. could be settled in Yuan. But we haven't heard about a special new BRICS reserve currency. And that could be the, the nail in the coffin. Is it backed by gold? It could be. It could be backed by a basket of commodities, although that's quite hard to organize because central banks do have physical gold in their reserves. They don't have oil in their reserves. China doesn't have any oil. But I think later this year we'll hear more. You know, I always enjoy talking to you because you helped us help us connect dots, okay? So here we have China, Russia. We have bank runs happening. And all of a sudden, central bank digital currencies was almost a conspiracy theory and there's a fast track to it, yeah. right? Uh, Fed now yeah. uh, being pushed out in, in July, a Federal Reserve yeah. payment system. Ron DeSantis coming out saying, we got to stop central bank digital currencies. It's in Florida. Yeah. Is there a, a connection among, amongst these three main pillars unfolding? Well, all central banks understand that we do have a problem in the international financial system since the fall of Lehman, since 2008. And if you study um, the accumulation of physical gold by China and Russia, it all started after 08. China wasn't active before 08. So they knew big changes were coming. They knew we were reaching the end of the current dollar system. So all these major powers have been preparing for the next phase of the international monetary system by accumulating gold. Yeah by working on a de-dollarization, a plan for de-dollarization. And this was, of course, this went in higher gear when the Ukraine war started and the financial reserves were confiscated of Russia. And, and that's why I said your book came out in 2013. Yeah. You had already yeah. uh, uh, begun uh, writing about this and it, it really does feel like it's, yeah, you know why? it's all unfolding. Why? 
my first book was published in 2007. I was a Dutch journalist at that time. Uh, I was a guest in many of the talk shows. Yep. And I always got the question, um, after the fall of Lehman, Willem, please explain what happened. Well, I could explain that. And they always asked me for a solution. So how can we solve this problem? I always said, I don't know. I don't know. You know, this is, this is such a yeah, structural yeah, problem. Yeah. So in the years after 2008 and 2009, I started to think about that question more and more. How could we solve this problem? And then I learned that in the history, we've seen monetary resets in the past. There's a way how you can solve these problems. Um, make bring major changes to the system it's a man-made system so you can change the plumbing system you can change the anchor current anchor is of course the us dollar and then i started to write this thesis in the big reset but what's interesting in 2016 i wrote another chapter i revised the big reset and i wrote the chapter on russia and china how they were working together in an effort to try to reconstruct the current world order and this has been ignored for years but it, yeah. it was and people can download the book for free on our website, so well, it's all there. You are the oracle of Amsterdam. That's what uh, that's Max <laughs> Kaiser said. But, <laughs> let, you know, on one of our episodes that ended up going viral, you had warned ahead of all this bank run about the dangers of being in a traditional system of the banks. And, and the superinflation. And, yeah. and the superinflation. I had asked you, you know, how comfortable do you feel being exposed to, to the banking system? I mean, have you adjusted your thoughts at all? now well it's a lot safer now because i <laughs> warned i think in the previous interview it was a year ago i warned that all uh, deposits above 100k uh, in europe and 200k in the us uh, are at risk because as you know legally uh, your savings aren't safe with the bank because you, uh, once your savings are in your bank account you know the money is owned by the bank and you have a, a claim on the bank and as we've seen in the last few weeks, uh, this, this has happened. And some people were uh, about to lose an awful lot of money uh, with the Silicon Valley Bank and, and the other banks. So that's why, the, F, uh, uh, that's why uh, the regulators had to guarantee all deposits. And that's, that's, that's end game stuff. Do you fear bail-ins? We had a bail-in here in Zurich. Not, not um, by depositors, by, but by uh, current uh, bondholders. And that was strange because the Credit Suisse was rescued, what was it, two, three days ago here. Normally, as a bondholder, you're better protected than an equity holder. But now, in this, in, this, uh, in this case, there was a bail-in of bondholders. So it shows when you own assets with counterparty risk, these assets are at risk. But does it also show that if President Biden and, and Yellen come out and say, don't worry, the yeah. system's yeah. safe. Is that that's, the warning? That's always the warning. That's always the <laughs> and warning. When they say, don't panic, that, that's the time to panic. But um, what, what's, what's interesting, and uh, when I uh, was reading the news about the rescue here in, uh, in Zurich, I just arrived that day. Um, I wrote a little piece for my new Patreon account. I opened the Patreon account so people can, can really follow all the reset stuff. I was, I, was, I was fed up by giving everything away for free on the internet and, and receiving all the negative comments. But, and then I wrote last Sunday that um, gold would benefit, Bitcoin would benefit, <laughs> and you should short the banks. Yeah. Well, what happened this week? Shorting the banks was a great idea. Bitcoin went up 30%, gold and silver right. went up 6%. So, so it, it's quite easy to understand it now. I think in the past you told me once gold hits 2000, sky could be the limit. Well. Yeah. We're, that, we're, we're flirting with it. Uh, by the time this interview airs, maybe we'll yeah. be there. And why this is so <laughs> significant, yeah. because we've touched and crossed 2,000 right. three times now, four yeah. times. Yeah. But in the next move, and it should happen in the next few weeks, um, gold will cross 2,000 and then, then the 2,000 will become support instead of resistance. And when 2,000 is the support level, so we bottom at 2000 and then start to run. That's when the major boom market will start. And that's what all the companies here in Zurich for the mining, the mining show are waiting for. Because if you look at the equities, the gold equities, they're not moving, hardly moving. They're still in a downtrend, actually. What do you look for for the mining companies you add to your fund? 
What's your criteria, top criteria? Well, first it's, it's large discoveries, new discoveries. Mm. We don't like uh, producers who end the year with less ounces in the ground because the price is depressed, the price is manipulated. So I want to have, I want to own shares in companies who have more ounces in the ground at the end of the year and who keep them in the ground waiting for higher prices. Willem, I, I was wondering whether I should go there with you because I know it's a conversation in itself, but when I think World Economic Forum, I think no, you because I know how much not. research you've done. Yeah. And I know this is like a conversation for a separate discussion, but I feel that there's so much cloud of mystery uh, you know, circulating the, the World Economic uh, Forum. Obviously, it's criticized. Why yeah. was it created? How yeah. much power they have? What's, what's your take on, on, on uh, Klaus? Klaus Schwab. <laughs> Klaus Schwab. <laughs> Well, and, and, he, and he, he is what, not, what, he, he what is not part that, they play in all this. I think he's not that evil as some people and pretend. social media mix. <laughs> you know, you, you should look at this background. He was a Swiss professor in Geneva in the, in the 80s. And then he started to organize a conference. was always a great idea. Invite people like Kissinger. And every year some more important guys came. And then he became... So, such a, well, special force within the elite. And you shouldn't forget when you have young leaders like Margarita in the Netherlands and Trudeau in Canada, mm. you know, they're, they're elected, they're not that experienced. Where can they go for advice? And Klaus Schwab understood this. So he said, well, come to us, we train you, we put you in the young leader class. So this is not a world conspiracy. It, 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 it developed this way. But he became powerful, and what happens with powerful people, you know, they, uh, they start to feel important. So he made statements that we infiltrated the cabinets, and he feels like the master of the world now. But, you know, Klaus is over 80. He so who's next? Who replaces him, right? Th that's, that's the question. And I think the World Economic Forum is Klaus Schwab when he leaves uh, it will be a different yeah. organization, but we shouldn't talk too much about the World Economic Forum. I guess just yeah. wrapping here, um, yeah. there's concerns about what we're facing, what we're going up against. Uh, I, 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 can we use the word economic crisis, global economic crisis? Well, it's more, more than that because um, what's most important that we are leaving a, an era, a period of over 40 years with declining interest rates, more globalization, more peace dividends, and that all stopped. That all stopped. And many people don't understand that. So we're now in an era with increasing interest rates, more inflation, deglobalization, less cooperation, more confrontation. And if you think about everything what happened, there's a new Cold War but it could easily turn into a new hot war. It's a hot war in Ukraine. Ukraine is used in a way also by the West. And, um, well, I always, I traveled a lot to China. Two of my books have been uh, translated mm -hmm. into Mandarin. I always thought that China was the adult in the room. But China has a new leader, and he's a very strong guy. And nobody really knows what we can expect from him. And that, that's, that's the big question mark now. And, and also, question mark, where does the U.S. dollar go from here? Well, that, that's the other risk, because the U.S. has one major advantage, or has had a one major advantage over all other countries and that was their military, the, the Navy. But with the new weapons being developed, uh, with the hypersonic weapons, you know, the US Navy with all their carriers, they're sitting ducks in the Pacific. So we, I, I'm in a WhatsApp group with some of the, well, brightest in the macro space. And, and there was this discussion very early in this morning. And we all agreed that the U.S. might need to choose to go to war, otherwise they'll end their, their privilege. And that's scary. That's absolutely frightening, Willem. And, and I spoke to a billionaire here yeah. in Surrey. He's well connected. His biggest worry is a hot war 
between China and the U.S. What should people be doing at home? Um, I guess, I mean, it seems trivial, but from an investment standpoint of protecting themselves financially in these well, times. Well, they know they should buy gold. That's why they watch this show. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we I always set it up for that. But though. we always had a debate, yeah. Bitcoin or gold. This week showed the answer. It's gold, silver, and Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is the fastest horse in the race, up 30% this month. It's just recovering. Don't put all your money in crypto, but maybe 5% of your net worth. It has done very well since 2009. It might do very well the next few years as well. Willem Middelkoop, author of The Big Reset, the Oracle of Amsterdam. Thank you. Too much honor. Thank you so much for joining me in beautiful Zurich. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Incredible coverage. More coming your way. So be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni Show here on Stansberry Research. And don't forget to sign up at DanielaCamboni.com. To stay on top of it all, speak to you soon. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.